I've been doing a lot of running around doing things around Palestine in the last month or so, and it feels nice to be on an explicitly socialist platform, an explicitly Marxist platform, so that gives us a bit more freedom to, to talk about lots of, uh, lots, of, lots of things. In the 1930s, Phil just mentioned it, in the 1930s, Palestine saw one of the greatest single anti-colonial revolts of the British Empire. It was inspired by Izadim al Qassam. That's a name that you would have heard uttered briefly in derogatory terms because it's the name that Hamas's military wing takes, Qassam Brigades. Qassam traveled around villages in Palestine trying to organize to prepare for an uprising. And he said that in preparing for an uprising, people should be aware in Palestine that they faced in the 1930s three enemies, not one. They faced Zionist settler colonists who were coming to steal their land and lives. They faced British imperialism, which governed the mandate in Palestine. And they faced a Palestinian bourgeoisie, wealthy Palestinians of the elite, who thought they could negotiate with British imperialism to get a better outcome uh, uh, than, uh, than they would otherwise get. So three enemies, settler colonialism, imperialism, and class forces domestically who knew that they stood to gain from shafting their own people and winning some small crumbs because they saw which way the wind was blowing. In the 1970s, Rassan Kalafani, who was just mentioned again by Hill, wrote of Qassam and of the uprising, inspired by that trio of enemies, inspired by that ability to name three forces against which Palestinians fought. And in the 1970s, he said, the world was different. Palestinians no longer faced an upstart Zionist settler movement that was seeking to establish a state. Now they faced a state. They no longer faced British imperialism running the mandate in Palestine. Now they faced American imperialism supporting the Zionist state, just as it supported the brutalization of people all over the world, from Chile to Vietnam. And they faced no longer just a local domestic set of ruling class forces that would be keen to do deals with imperialism to sell them out. They also faced states across the Arab world, from you know, Saudi Arabia to the old monarchy in Egypt, uh, to Morocco, uh, states all over the Arab world, uh, which, which were in hock to the interests of imperialism. That history, that history of Palestinians thinking and talking about the challenges of their oppression and the strategies for their liberation, that history of Palestinians identifying not just Israelis, but a whole world system that functioned through their domination and dispossession, just as it has functioned through the domination and dispossession of people for 500 years since the colonization of the Americas, if not before. That history of Palestinians identifying themselves with a fourth world of the stateless, with Native Americans, saying, we have seen what happened to you. We will not allow ourselves to be destroyed. That whole history of Palestinians insisting that they wouldn't surrender is obscured in Britain. It's obscured in the West, even from those who are sympathetic to Palestinians, who tell us often of the horrific crimes of the State of Israel. We hear a lot about the horrors of the State of Israel, but less, less, and this is what it really is to humanize people, to see people as human beings, not just as suffering people, not just as people who are bombed and blockaded and brutalized, though they are, but as people who think and fight and believe in their own freedom, as we all do. That history is riskier to tell. You know, I think a lot of people have felt, since October 7th, a certain chilling of what you can and can't say. An awareness that people lose their jobs or are uh, harassed in their jobs, worry about keeping their jobs, worry then about paying their rent because they say the wrong thing on social media, because they talk about Palestine in ways that can get them quickly attacked. And we live in an imperialist ally of the State of Israel, which authored the Balfour Declaration, which promised the land of Palestine to settlers, and which turned, in a word, the whole indigenous population of Palestine into a negative in their own land. Palestinians were referred to in the Balfour Declaration only as non-Jews. We live in the land that did that to the Palestinian people. And today, we have debates about what we think about Palestine. But someone can stand up on TV and say whatever they like about how wonderful they think the IDF are. No one, no one, none of us in this room, no one could ever say, and I'm not saying it, could ever say that they think Hamas is wonderful. That's support for a prescribed terrorist organization. It's illegal. So we don't operate in a context of free discussion and debate. We operate in an imperial ally of the Zionist state, the so-called state of Israel. It's offensive to me that they took that name of my people, Shema Israel, God says to us on Mount Sinai, hero Israel. The Zionist state tries to take it. The Zionist state in Palestine, the so-called state of Israel. 
Um, we live in a context in which an imperialist ally of that entity um, uh, places all kinds of uh, restrictions by law or by chilling on what we can say. So it's worth, in the face of those restrictions, recovering not just a sense of our justified horror at Israeli crimes, but also a sense of what it is to yearn for freedom, a sense of the beautiful traditions of oppressed people who <laughs> yearn for freedom. And everyone in Britain knows it. Just look at the way the right in Britain talks about the Blitz. Right? They talk not just about the horrors of Nazi Germany, not just about how horrific it would have been if Nazi Germany had invaded Britain. They talk about an all-out war with every single resource at people's disposal. People being willing to risk their lives, not as terrorists, but as martyrs. People being willing to risk their lives flying in the skies. Why that desperation? Why that risk? Because their sovereignty was under threat. Because their ability to rule themselves was under threat. And it's a beautiful thing, we're told, when people hand out poppies to remember the fallen. The Blitz. When Ukrainians have their country invaded, and some people ask if there should be a peace process, Tory politicians stand up in the House of Commons and say, how dare you? How dare you fail to understand that every single inch of Ukrainian territory must be recovered? There can be no talk of any peace process, because it is a beautiful thing to love your land and your home and to insist that it shouldn't be controlled by invaders. The Blitz, Ukraine, we can talk like that, but there is this selective principle. Some people don't get to talk like that, have never got to talk like that. That's the world we live in. It's not just Palestinians. Algerians weren't allowed to talk like that. South Africans weren't allowed to talk like that. People all over most of the world weren't allowed to talk like that. And Ukrainians are only briefly allowed to talk like it because they're white for five minutes because it's Russia invading them. Five minutes ago, they were here as Eastern European migrants to steal our jobs, and they weren't white at all. So it's a very, very selective principle. Who gets to believe? Not just who gets not to be bombarded. It's not just enough to be horrified at penning people into an open-air prison, trapping them and then bombing them. It's not just enough to be horrified at that. It's worth remembering that there are traditions of Palestinian political thought and action which care about human freedom and which are denigrated by this selective principle which says only some people get to have rights. So what I wanted to say on this socialist platform is that I think the core, the kind of normative core of Marxism lies in the rejection of that kind of selective principle. If you read in Marx's notebooks as he was preparing capital, uh, his so-called Grundrisse, his, his brief, sketchy descriptions of what life after capital will be like, the language he always uses is this language of free individuality, very different from the kind of barracks room image of socialism in which you do as you're told by a central state, right? Free individuality. Why is he so keen on the concept of individuality? Well, for Marx, individuality is not opposed to community to sociability, to collectivity. We all need other people to help us flourish as individuals. I wouldn't know that smoked salmon bagels are the best food in the world if no one had ever given me them. Right? We need other people in order to develop and hone and flourish as individuals. Individuality for Marx is the opposite, not of community, but of hierarchy. Free individuality is that world in which someone ceases to be a worker and a boss, a man and a woman, black and white, and is able simply to craft themselves as an individual to work out their desires and then to hone their ability to meet them. That is the core of the most radical form of politics, of a communist politics, that Marx saw in workers who had nothing to lose but their chains, and that anti-colonial struggles in their most radical edge have, have, have pushed forward in saying we don't see the nation state as our final horizon of possibility. We're opposed to empire because we're opposed to a world in which some people are coding for different rights than others. That's why around the world people care so much about Palestine. It's not because they're anti-Semitic and hate Jews. I'm sure some people that's true. But the reason most people around the world care so much about Palestine, even though there are atrocities everywhere, is because in Palestine it is written into the law that people, because they're called Jews, travel on one set of roads in the West Bank. And people, because they're called Palestinians, travel on a different set of roads, different hospitals, different courts. If you're an Israeli settler in the West Bank, you commit a crime, you go to an Israeli civilian court. If you're a Palestinian, you're accused of throwing a stone like David threw against Goliath in our great religious tradition. You don't go to a civilian court, you go to a military court which boasts 99% conviction rates. That claim that some human beings should have greater rights than others, should be coded for greater rights than others, is the thing that offends people in Palestine. It's most overt in the West Bank. It's most overt in Gaza, where people, because they're Palestinian, are penned in to an open-air prison and bombed. But it exists in over 500 laws in the Zionist state, the so-called State of Israel, be behind the 1967 lines, in which more than 15% of land is owned by a settler colonial body, the Jewish National Fund, which says it can only be bought and sold to Jews. How would we feel in Britain if there was an organisation which said land could only be bought and sold to white people? Well, maybe it's the kind of future that some people want to take us to. So that's why... That's why people are horrified by what happens in Palestine, because it is the marking of some people for more rights than others. And I think the most radical, exciting thing about socialist politics is the refusal of any of those distinctions. 
But I say it as something important for our period because not all socialist politics is like that. Because some socialist politics is about not, on the kind of right wing of, of, of the left, is about not um, the abolition of all differences of social status between people, but the affirmation of some people's status, which says, actually, you're a worker in Britain, we're going to give you a welfare state. And maybe it'll come through plunder elsewhere, but we'll affirm your place within the nation. You know, take, for example, the National Health Service. I always thought the National Health Service is a little island of communism in Britain. Right? When you walk in the hospital doors, they don't ask any questions about you. You get health care because you're sick. You're a person you need to be taken care of. No one cares about anything else about you. Well, if you go, I recently, my, my grandmother was, was, was very unwell. I was in hospital. And I see the hospitals full of posters, which cross full of posters, that say the NHS isn't free for everyone. And I thought, that's strange. I thought the whole point of the NHS was that it's free for everyone. Well, they say it's called the National Health Service, not the International Health Service. It's not free for migrants. So there's an institution that was a kind of little island of communism in, you know, I'm being naive. <laughs> but that, but that, that could have, that has some hope of that being turned instead into an institution for affirming the status. You're British and so you get this treatment. Not you're a human being and we're smashing. Our politics is about smashing all distinctions between human beings so that everyone gets to live in dignity and freedom. So that choice between a politics of the abolition of all hierarchy in which everyone, in which, we, in which we don't code people for different packages of rights, bigger or smaller, based on where they were born or what they look like or how they talk or anything else. That opposition between that politics and a politics which says we're trying to carve out a space of safety where those who are poorer within our midst can have some protection, can affirm their status as part of a community. I think that distinction is one which in the coming years is very important to left politics. And I think that Palestine is a kind of lightning rod for that distinction, because those of us who stand in solidarity with Palestine insist on a politics that says not we're here to argue about one state or two states, we're here to oppose the regime, the machinery of domination, which says some people have more rights than others. And in the coming years, we face a politics dominated by climate catastrophe, in which we hear today that the current COP conference, so-called climate conference, has more lobbyists from fossil fuel companies present at the conference than it does representatives from the top 10 most vulnerable countries affected by climate change. Why? Because those countries aren't places like Britain and America, they're places like Sudan and Somalia. So a climate conference organized by the UAE, a climate conference organized by world capitalist powers, ensures that fossil fuel companies are better represented than the poorest people in the world. Let's find a way of mitigating the damage of climate change so that all the seas don't overflow everywhere. But if we have to shaft millions, billions of people in the global south, let's do it. That's the politics of some people in relation to climate change. We face in the coming years an increasingly aggressive politics in relation to migration. And I've long thought there's a deep similarity between the politics of migration and the politics of Palestine, not least because many of the people I know who care most, some of the people I love most dearly who care most about Palestine, came to this country through difficult and irregular means. Um, uh, and so know what it is to be, to be looked at by Western power and told that you don't matter and have no rights. Know what it is to, to, to look in the face of the Western cop and know that they'd rather you drown at sea. That's what Palestinians know. Well, we face a politics package announced just yesterday by the Tory government to try to split up families if they're not both earning 38k. We face a politics that will increasingly attack migrants. And the question for us is, do we have a left politics that makes any kinds of concessions to that? Or do we have an uncompromising politics of human freedom that centers in our politics the struggles uh, of, of migrants against that kind of racism? And lastly, Amid climate change and amid the increasingly aggressive politics of migration, while millions of people seek to move to avoid not least the devastations wrought by climate change, not least the devastations wrought by Western imperial interventions, I hate that euphemism, intervention wars, we also face a moment of imperial decline for the West, thank God. We also face a moment in which Britain and America see less and less that they can do as they like all over the world and have to deal more with rivals. Not rivals, I think, who are sincerely invested in universal human freedom. I don't think Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin are but at least present some counterweight to the sheer total violence which American imperialism has been able to wield around the world. And so in the face of those three kinds of challenges, of a warming, heating, devastated planet, of huge population flows all over the world, of an anxious West in decline, as you see in the inter-imperialist conflict in Ukraine, amid those kinds of challenges, we have a question as a left, which is, are we going to be the people who try to mark out a space for a community of the workers or whatever else it is, within our society whom we want to still have some protection while the world goes up in flames? Or are we going to have a politics that refuses those kinds of distinctions and seeks everyone everywhere 
to be free. That is the kind of politics that Palestine represents. That's why it's so inspiring that so many people pour into the streets about Palestine. And I think that's why states are so concerned when so many people pour out onto the streets about Palestine. So deeply concerned. More even sometimes than when people march on trade union demonstrations. I shouldn't feel the need to oppose these things. But the French state starts it. The German state pushes it. The British state joins in. Huge concern about the crowds on the streets of Palestine. We're hateful and so on. Because they know that we represent that embryonic constituency of a kind of universal human freedom, which is opposed to all of their Western values. British values. Opposed to all of them, because they're all about hierarchy and domination. And saying that some people have rights and other people should drown in the Mediterranean or be penned into open air prisons in Gaza or die because the seas rise and the forests burn because of decisions taken by corporate profiteers in London and Washington and people in Bangladesh suffer and people in South America suffer and they should just die quietly. We're the ones who say we're not going to accept that. Who say everyone everywhere should live in freedom. So we have to strengthen here in the West that fifth column, which says we are opposed to your values. We stand in solidarity with millions, billions of people all over the world, sometimes having disagreements among ourselves and across countries, of course. But we are facing a moment of Western imperial decline. We're facing a moment where that whole Western civilization is kind of up for grabs and is in real trouble and is panicking about the rise of China. We're facing a moment in which the, the whole world, the planet we inhabit, is in peril from the burning flames that capitalists have placed upon it. We're facing a world in which the stability of communities that have lived in the same place for thousands of years is in ructions and ruptures as huge numbers of people move. And we see that moment as an opportunity to advocate for a politics which uses the technologies, the immense technologies of automation to give us lives of leisure and care and not impoverished unemployment while Elon Musk has his fantasies about colonising Mars. We, we see those challenges and, and advocate a politics of universal freedom in them. So I just want to finish with a quote, and then I'll shut up, I'm sorry. Um, I thought I was allowed to here, you know. <laughs> this is a quote from 1920. <clears throat> After the Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks assembled a Congress of the Peoples of the East at Baku. Thousands of delegates from all over Asia. Huge numbers of interpreters, many different <coughs> languages. And at the end of the conference, one of the things that these people from everywhere, from Kazakhstan to China to the southern tip of India, one of the things that they did was release an appeal to the workers of Europe. And I find it striking reading today. They said to the workers of Europe a warning against the kind of nationalist politics of social democracy which says, look, we can win healthcare and education for ourselves, and we don't need to worry too much about those faraway causes people suffering elsewhere. The delegates at Baku said, if you were to free yourselves alone, leaving us in slavery and bondage, you yourselves would fall the next day into that same slavery and bondage. No, they didn't tell them, by the way, to check their privilege or be good allies. They said there's a politics of solidarity. We can all win freedom together. You yourselves would fall the next day into that same slavery and bondage. For in order to keep us in chains and in prison, you would have to form in the east and in the south of the world, forces of prison warders and packs of bloodhounds to guard us. You would have to raise armies, as indeed they did, to keep us under an iron heel. You would have to give power over us to your generals and governors. And they, having tasted the sweetness of life without work at the expense of our labor in the east and south of the world, they, your generals and governors, having learned how to hold generations of toilers in bondage, would soon turn their bayonets against you, and the wealth accumulated in Asia and Africa would be used to thrust you back into your previous slavery. If you were to forget us now, you would have to pay for that mistake. You would have cause to remember our chains when you felt chains on your own hands. You cannot free yourselves without helping us in our struggle for liberation. The wealth of our countries is in the hands of the capitalists, a means of enslaving you. I read those words from 1920 and think about those decades after World War II, those brief decades of welfare states and social protection before world capitalism, which had continued to brutalize and destroy people all over Africa and Asia and South, and South America, turned itself back to brutalize workers and women and black struggles and others in the North and called it neoliberalism. I look at that history of a brief attempt to win some small crumbs followed by that destructive counter-revolution and wish that in 1920, the words of those Bolshevik workers at Baku had been heeded. And the workers of Europe had said, we need a universal struggle to free everyone, or none of us will be free. It didn't happen in 1920. 
and we paid an enormous price in the 20th century. It didn't happen that people all over the world came together to get rid of the forces of domination that would divide us. It didn't happen, and so we witnessed the horrors of Auschwitz because it didn't happen. It didn't happen, and so we witnessed the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki because it didn't happen. It didn't happen, and so we witnessed napalm because it didn't happen. It didn't happen, and so today the people of Palestine are occupied and besieged and colonized because it didn't happen. It didn't happen in 1920. But that warning was heeded that people all over the world came together. But the purpose of this movement, global movement, from the streets of Indonesia to the streets of Washington, D.C., in solidarity not only with Palestinians being besieged by the Zionist entity, in solidarity not only with the Palestinian call for freedom, for a struggle for freedom, in solidarity not only with Palestinians, but with that universal demand that no one should be marked out for a smaller package of rights, the hope of our movement all over the world is that though it didn't succeed in 1920, this time, this time, we have to win. Thanks so much.